Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the uh, latest um, installment in our Impulses to Innovation webinars. Uh, my name is Stephen McAvoy, I'm the chair of today's um, webinar. I'm just going to introduce uh, Professor Mike Bradley from WorkSafe Design Limited, who's going to give a talk today on the uh, air hood for COVID protection that he designed and prototyped during the um, COVID outed, uh lockdown last year. Uh, so we'll we'll go into that quite quickly. Um, I will just say before we start that if you have any questions, um, please just pop them in the ask a question box. And when we get to the end, I will I will ask them directly to Mike and, and we'll get all, all responses back in. Um, but without further ado, I'll pass you over to Mike for the presentation. Thank you, Stephen, for that uh, introduction. So I'm just uh, going to uh, give, tell you a little bit about my background first of all before we start. Um, I'm a professor of bulk and particulate technologies at the University of Greenwich and as such I've got a consultancy and research uh, group here at the university that deals with lots of aspects of particulate materials. Now of course a lot of the particulate materials we deal with are things like coal and iron ore and grain and so on, but dusts and fine particulates are also part of our, uh, our perspective on things. So um, uh, fine things floating in the air, in other words. So um, I'll tell you a little bit more about WorkSafe Design in a moment. So uh, a little bit of background to this, uh, this story. This um, effectively, um, started in uh, early 2000 when I'm sure you all remember there was a new infection from China which seemed to be sweeping across the Far East and of course this wasn't the first time we'd seen this if you remember we had SARS and we had MERS and various other infections and a lot of people in this country didn't seem to be that bothered about it to be perfectly honest but um, it didn't seem as though it was, going, it was long before it started to arrive here uh, we weren't as successful as keeping it out as we were with SARS and MERS. And um, this seemed to me to be a pretty scary thing. It kept me awake at night, I can tell you. The, uh, they were reporting something like a 1% fatality rate. And, uh, you know, in my own mind thinking, well, what does that mean for the UK? That means something like 600,000 deaths. Now, just to put that in perspective, we have about a million deaths a year in the UK. So this is not perhaps quite as uh, dramatic as it might f first seem, but nevertheless, it was still um, pretty high compared with anything we've seen, certainly since Spanish flu. The Spanish flu of 1918, the death rate of that was significantly higher, by the way. Uh, but a scary, a scary thought. And uh, of course, the first thing, first effect we saw in this country uh, coming closer to home was uh, when Italy was hit. And uh, the Italy was hit very hard as the first uh, first European country to have a, a really large outbreak. Um, it was uh, quite dramatic because they were unprepared, as I should say, even even worse prepared than uh, we were because uh, they took the first hit. And uh, we saw a situation of medics dropping like flies. Um, nurses, doctors were, were dying at a high rate. Uh, there weren't the healthcare staff or the beds available to treat people. Sick people were piling up in the corridors. And uh, it was quite a scary thought. I'm still not convinced at that stage that any of the politicians really here took it seriously in spite of that. Till it, till it uh, arrives on their own doorstep, they tend not to. So um, anyway, the, uh, the net result of this, of course, was that Italy applied a complete lockdown. Uh, all businesses were put on ice, the streets were deserted, and uh, of course this put a lot of people um, out uh, from their ways of making a living. And uh, it was kind of apparent, I think, to any of us that uh, uh, had any sort of dare I say it, common sense, that this was going to hit us before long. We weren't going to be able to keep this out. 
But the thing that kept me awake at night more than anything was the realization of what this sort of economic shutdown was likely to to, to mean. Because if people can't work together without getting sick, that's a pretty big uh, deal. At that time, the economists were talking about and predicting a 10% slowdown of the economy. Now, 10% slowdown of the economy doesn't seem that dramatic, that drastic, but to put that in perspective, in the Great Depression of the 1920s, there was a 6% contraction of the global economy. So 10% contraction basically would be potentially pretty severe. Uh, and of course, the poverty and destitution, we know very well from where you look at uh, less developed countries, and uh, as the life expectancy increases as, as countries develop economically, um, poverty and destitution is a huge killer, and that would possibly kill many times more people than the infection itself. So um, obviously, being an engineer, my uh, business is to solve problems. Uh, the uh, The whole... The whole reason why I uh, do the work that I do is because it's interesting to look for difficulties and, and find ways around them. So it occurred to me that um, I got not just an interest, but a duty to try and do something about this. And that weighed heavily on my mind. So I spent a lot of time thinking about this. And uh, if you think about it, actually, it's about breaking the chain of infection. It's so that people can work close to one another without breathing each other's breath and particularly touching their faces and, and especially their eyes. Um, it subsequently uh, turned out that a lot of the infections amongst medics in Italy were acquired when they were taking their PPE off and uh, touching the outside of the PPE and then getting their hands, their contaminated hands close to their eyes was what caused a lot of infections. It's not widely realized that uh, generally it's thought more infections go in through the eyes, certainly colds and airborne diseases, than through the mouth. And if we could break that, if we could put a suitable barrier there, then we could uh, allow people to work together safely. And that would avoid uh, a massive economic lockdown. At this time, the government were telling us, don't wear a face mask. Now, where on earth they got that idea, I can't, I, I can't imagine, because ever since we were, were young, you know, mum used to tell us to put a hanky over our mouth if we sneezed or coughed. And uh, the government telling us, oh, you don't need to wear a face mask, it has no benefit, appeared to me completely bizarre. So as it happened, I also got involved in some research with a group at Cambridge University that uh, looked at the, uh, the effectiveness of face masks and the paper that we published fairly quickly, uh, made its way into the proceedings of the Royal Society and got mentioned in, uh, in Parliament. And it was that paper that was largely credited with the government eventually, uh, after a long period of time, changing their, their mind about uh, recommending face masks. But that's another story. The, uh, the point about this barrier is this is about airflow and filtration. And of course, to anybody who works in bulk solids handling, airflow and filtration is a very common thing. We deal with dust extraction and pneumatic conveying and so on. And uh, of course, filtering particles out of the air is a, a natural part of that. So it occurred to me that, you know, how could I bring uh, my expertise and the expertise of my group to bear on this? Another dimension to this also, um, and I'm just trying to sort of explain to you the, uh, the, the route by which these ideas, if you like, were generated, was that I had uh, personal experience of using um, air-fed uh, breathing apparatus for spraying because I uh, used to be quite an enthusiastic restorer of old cars. And of course, uh, the paints that are used these days for, for spraying cars uh, are, are highly, highly toxic. Um, the, um, uh, they contain cyanide uh, materials. So uh, for spraying isocyanate paints, uh, you can't rely on a traditional kind of spray mask. Instead, what you do, you have a, a mask that goes over your head and is fed for, with clean compressed air from outside of the spray booth. But the same sort of PPE, is used widely, of course, in many other industries, in asbestos, in lead, in nuclear facilities. What's generally referred to as an air-fed mask, 
whereby you have a, uh, a flow of clean air into a, a hood over your head and that uh, prevents any particles from getting in. Even if you do have a leak, it's going to be clean air outwards and not particles inwards. And of course, there are tens of thousands of people that use this equipment every day working in uh, environments that are much more dangerous than a COVID ward. If you think about, as I say, spraying of isocyanate paints, you only need to get a few breaths of that and it can make you seriously ill. So um, it occurred to me, could we take the, this as an approach and make something suitable for use in the healthcare sector? So a few early experiments here that uh, that were, uh, were that, that I made, basically uh, making up, if you like, a plastic bag and uh, putting it over my head and using a, an air pump and a filter. Uh, initially, um, I used a, an, an air pump and filter that's used for uh, welding respirators. Um, questionable whether this would be suitable for healthcare use because, of course, viruses are significantly smaller compared with the uh, uh, fume particles from welding, but nevertheless, to to assess the principle, it seemed to be uh, seemed to be kind of sensible. But one of the key things was we didn't want to finish up with a mask like the one that I just showed you in the previous picture. Uh, this sort of thing um, here, which is not that uh, user friendly towards the patient in a healthcare setting. We were looking for something that would be much uh, much less obtrusive. Uh, much less restrictive to view as well, to view the person as well as for the person to view out. So we came up with this idea of a, uh, a, a, a cheap, lightweight, potentially disposable uh, polyethylene or PVC clear uh, bag, basically, with a, a permeable cuff so that when you pump the air into it, the air comes out from the cuff and the pressurization inside keeps it in shape. So you don't need to wear anything on your head. And also this would enable you, if you needed to, to wear glasses or a hard hat or whatever. So um, the welding pump in itself, the design of the welding air pump, presented quite a lot of problems for use in the healthcare environment. Apart from the questionable filter efficacy, uh, the noise uh, generated inside makes it difficult to hear people outside. And uh, the cleanability wasn't suitable, so there was all sorts of problems with that. So uh, nevertheless, uh, comparing this with uh, what people, what medics were using at the time uh, with uh, a face mask and a, and a hood and a visor as well, the, the comparison is much different because it's so much easier to wear. There's less on your face. People can see who you are. Uh, there's no junctions between these things to leak. And the positive pressure, of course, gives a much, much higher level of protection. Also, taking it off is less hazardous as well because you just lift it from the bottom. So uh, it was obvious that uh, this was something that had some potential. So we tried to, we were um, interested in pursuing it, encouraged us to pursue it. So the question is, how can we get this to market? So my first thought was, these uh, there are quite a lot of companies who put themselves out as being innovation led. And uh, a number of these involved in doing small air handling kits. So I tried to make contact, first of all, uh, with Dyson and with Vax and um, with one or two others. And the approach, of the, the um, response I got was, well, we're busy making ventilators, apart from which we don't take on products that, we, that are not invented by us. You know, if it's not invented here, we're not interested. And that was more or less what they said. And uh, we'll think about it, but don't bother calling us. So um, we looked at uh, companies also that were making air purifying respirators already, the people that make the welding respirators and so on. And their, their response was, well, no, we have our own products. We uh, will send you our air pumps so if you're interested. And this is not an opportunity for us. So we looked at PPE suppliers to healthcare, but they were all saying, well, you know, we're not interested in anything new. We're flat out just trying to buy the same old cheap Chinese rubbish masks and uh, trying to get them imported. That's, that's, that's all our business is about. Uh, and uh, then various other companies that I knew that make electronic and mechanical assemblies, the general response was not our field. We're on furlough. We're not here. Call us back when the pandemic is over. I, I got that response from several, which seemed to me utterly bizarre. So days and weeks I spent on the phone 
trying to uh, trying to go through a whole lot of contacts. Uh, I can't even begin to count the number of uh, phone calls and number of companies that uh, I was in touch with over this. But generally, the uh, the enthusiasm uh, wasn't there from uh, companies that were already doing either something similar or something else. Government support was something that also I tried to uh, uh, tried hard to, uh, to to get attention uh, through local MPs, Department of Health, Westminster offices of various ministers. I, I, I wrote, faxed, emailed, uh, phoned. Uh, and the response was basically nothing. The, uh, the, the general response was actually, uh, if you can make some standard masks, that's fine. Anything else, go away. And uh, it was clear that the whole establishment of government had, had retreated basically into a bubble in Westminster and really were not um, receptive to anything from outside. So uh, I did get great encouragement, though, from uh, a chap who used to be the uh, manufacturing columnist of the FT, uh, Peter Marsh. He's, um, he runs uh, an outfit called Made Here Now, which promotes the, uh, the manufacturing uh, of uh, all sorts of things in the UK, engineering goods and um, home goods and all sorts of things like that. And uh, he had uh, a lot of contacts amongst uh, manufacturing companies. Uh, Toyota were very helpful, and Toyota helped us uh, in some of the development. Uh, Burberry as well, of course, who, uh, who make fabrics. Um, nobody, however, willing to take it on as a project. So we still had to, I, I had to lead it uh, myself, more or less. Um, so at this stage, uh, getting a little bit desperate, I put out a, a call to the members of Sharper. Sharper is the Solids Handling and Processing Association. As it happens, uh, I chair this association. It's uh, a trade association for companies in the bulk solids handling field. We have 111 member companies in the UK, and uh, these companies make all sorts of things from belt conveyors to, uh, uh, to, to fluidized beds to um, really anything to do with, uh, with, with powders, and of course, filtration being one of those things. And uh, there were five sharper members who actually answered the call. Uh, also a viral epidemiologist within uh, within the university who uh, proved to be quite useful and an anaesthetist as well who was concerned about close work with COVID patients because when anaesthetists have to intubate a patient they have to get very close to the patient's mouth and they're very conscious of the danger. So this was uh, where it kind of started to turn around a little bit. Also a merchant banker who was a friend of mine but but he told me basically you're trying to do this the wrong way if you think you can do it on a not-for-profit basis. The only way you'll make this work is if you do it commercially. You'll have to get the, that's the only way you'll get the investment is if there's money to be made. So uh, more hands, more contacts, led to more expertise and more uh, confidence. So uh, by um, uh, building this network and the, uh, the people that you see here, uh, three of these people had already started and run their own SMEs, so they knew about uh, starting and running a company. Uh, they all had confidence that this was a sound product and, of course, design input to make, all, all being technical people as well, but also knowledge of marketing, finance, uh, and various other aspects as well. And uh, contact amongst medics as well, uh, as it happened, which was very useful. So we seem to be on a little bit of a launch pad there. We founded a new company. This would have been in, where are we? This was about um, uh, June 2020. So uh, nearly 18 months ago now. Um, we developed a plan. We started to divide up the work between us, taking responsibility uh, separately, uh, regular directors meeting every week. And we started to actually then work towards uh, building a prototype um, uh, developing our own uh, manufacturing um, supply chain uh, and so on. Um, there were quite a few barriers that uh, we identified at, a, at an early stage. Some of these seem somewhat perverse, you might say. The re one of the regulatory barriers is that the um, uh, air, all air, all what they call powered air purifying respirators. That is to say, anything that pumps air into something that you wear over your head must meet an EN standard. And But the only standard out there was written for PAPRs for welding. 
which are, of course, not totally appropriate for healthcare use. Some of the things that are required for welding PAPRs, high level of fire resistance, impact from a flying piece of a grinding wheel, a 25 kilo pull load on the hoses, all of these completely inappropriate for healthcare, but because that's the only standard, we, these are the things we were going to have to meet, in spite of this being, in most cases, perfectly irrelevant to uh, the setting it was going to be used in. The barrier, the cost barrier as well, uh, because the law says that any PAPR has to be uh, tested uh, by what we call a notified body, um, the, uh, the cost of that is considerable, so a minimum of £20,000 and what was quoted to us as a three month lead time. And then there's a 6K annual fee and a full retest every three years, by the way. And of course that fixes every detail. So any change at any point is gonna trigger a full retest. Even, even just the means by which components are manufactured. So the notified body would not accept, for example, uh, components, even on things like, you know, the body of the pump, simple plastic components, uh, they would not accept those made by additive manufacturing, you know, rapid prototyping, uh, if they were eventually going to be made by injection molding. So basically this meant that we had to make a huge investment in all the necessary tooling, especially for the plastic moldings for the pump, before we could even, even start notified body testing. Um, and of course, there's the cost of making, doing all our own tests beforehand to make sure that it was going to pass. And I'll come back to this because this has been a very serious barrier to uh, getting this into, uh, into use. Obviously, financial barriers, they turn to be, they, they, they are, uh, were not insignificant. Um, testing, uh, getting tooling made, patenting and so on. Uh, very little invest interest, though, from commercial investors. We uh, approached a number, and um, none believed that it had a future or that the IP was sufficiently protectable. However, I have to say, we had a fantastic response from Innovate UK. Innovate UK put out a call uh, for um, projects, project proposals to do with uh, controlling COVID. And we were fortunate enough to receive a grant from Innovate UK to help us with all of these uh, massive costs that uh, were necessary to get up to the point of being ready for notified body testing. Uh, also, we had a lot of help from Lewisham Hospital. They, they paid for a batch of test prototypes, which uh, gave us a bit of a boost as well. So uh, there were positives there as well. There were people who believed in us, shall we say. Other barriers, timing, you know, when to submit for notified body testing, because if you submit too early before you've really got the, the prototypes fully tested and, uh, and, and shaken down, there's a danger you might have to make some changes and then uh, go back for, for further retesting. But on the other hand, if you leave it too late, would that would miss opportunities to protect people. So um, this was quite a significant thing to overcome. And of course, you can't sell uh, equipment in the UK without at this time a CE mark, and you can't get the CE mark without the notified body testing. So we, there wasn't even any point in starting the marketing push. So supply chain performance proved to be uh, okay, except with regard to filtration. And uh, we, got, uh, we got some filters uh, originally from uh, an ISO 9000 UK companies with them, uh, the filter medium being specified to what they call a HEPA H14 standard. This HEPA H14 is supposed to stop 99.99% .99 of particles of the size of a virus. We did some testing on this. It stopped 54% absolutely hopeless. This of course set us back many weeks when we were on the threshold of testing the final production prototypes. So there's a lesson, don't trust filtration companies. But anyway, that's another thing. Batteries, of course, these days all made in China. Uh, lead times proved to be difficult to get. Uh, one of the things that, the, to, to me that this has uh, brought home is just how dependent we are on China for everything we need these days. And if China's got a problem, we've all got a problem. So here's a few key features of the product before I go to uh, talk uh, about the um, where we are now. 
So the idea of this uh, is to use, as I said, positive pressure. Because if you've got something over your head and you've got positive pressure inside it, then of course nothing can get in. Any leak is going to be of clean air outwards. Uh, and of course that gives you the pump that pressurizes it, gives you a positive flow, so you've always got fresh air. And uh, that makes this so much more um, comfortable to wear compared with wearing a mask that you have to breathe through and goggles and such like as well, because there's nothing actually resting on your head with this. Uh, filtration level, as I say, uh, they're a uh, high level. We tested it, uh, and uh, I should call out, actually, um, the FM, Facilities Management Division of Sainsbury's, because they were concerned about their maintenance people having to change uh, air conditioning filters and being uh, subject to virus exposure. And they were extremely helpful, and they gave us a couple of days of their time on their test facility up in the Midlands. Uh, uh, and put this uh, through its paces very thoroughly. And so, as I said, the key thing about this, obviously, you've got nothing on your face. There's nothing clamped to your head, so you don't get headaches or neck aches or pressure sores or whatever, and you've got complete freedom of head movement. And because it's light, it's comfortable to wear for extended periods, you can move your head in all directions. Uh, because it's a flexible plastic, you can... You can uh, adjust your spectacles or even remove them if you want just through the plastic that's uh, and then it, 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 you just push it in with your hands do what you want to and it reinflates um, and one of the key things that was important to us that came out of early trials with uh, with medics was that quietness was important because previous air pumps as I said used for this generate a lot of noise and then you can't hear when you're in inside this so we spent quite a lot of time and energy researching silencer design <coughs> in order that um, you don't get any or you don't get any significant level of noise inside this compared with the general noise that's around you in an office environment, say, the noise from the pump is low. There's no other device on the market that gives you those kind of advantages. Uh, ease of communication, as I said, because the noise is low, you can talk to one another quite easily. You can use the telephone and such like, put it over a hard hat or ear defenders. These kind of things are not a problem. And because you can move your head in any direction, no problems with doing close work or work in difficult, um, difficult to reach areas with it. Uh, and of course, very friendly to others because uh, a big problem in the healthcare sector with uh, having all the medics uh, completely masked up with, uh, with, with a face shield and a close fitting mask and all of these kind of things. But they can't recognize each other. The patients can't recognize them. It's very scary for patients. So this, um, this idea of being able to see people's head and face, and indeed for those that are hard of hearing, to lip read, because of course quite a lot of pa uh, COVID patients tend to be in the older generation, uh, that was a big advantage. So this is what the uh, the air pump and filter unit uh, essentially looks like. So it's uh, it's a simple white clean design of molded plastic. Uh, can either be belt or backpack mounted. Battery life of worked out in the end 12 hours. 12 hours is essentially what uh, uh, what's required for a full shift in uh, in, in healthcare. Um, the filter life depends on the environment, but it's typically rated as months. And obviously warnings for if you get uh, to a low battery and, and so on. So we thought now it was more or less job done, and all we'd got to do was get the uh, get the CE mark. How wrong we were! Late 90, late 2020, Brexit, of course, which had been uh, bubbling away for four years suddenly gathered momentum. CE marking was out. UK CA marking was going to be in. Uh, so we were finally jumping off the cliff like a bunch of lemmings. And where were we going to land? So the question was, what did this mean for our notified body approval? It was clear that one thing, there would be an end if we applied for a CE mark testing to European standards, there would be an end to the, uh, the certification on that. But when would the CE mark be valid until? 
I'm now talking uh, essentially this was back in uh, well, about the turn of the year. So around about December last year. Well, no, before that even, this was uh, started to be an issue. So what should we do? Should we get a CE mark or should we do a UKCA mark? Well, there wasn't a UKCA mark at that time. All we were told was that CE wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be any good anymore. Who could give us a UKCA mark? Uh, and what standard would they use? Would they use the European standard or would there be a new British standard? Would the European standard be acceptable in Britain? What did this mean for the cost of testing? Would we have to pay twice if we wanted a CE mark to sell in Europe? And by the way, CE marks are still accepted all around the world in, in many other countries, which UKCA mark isn't, of course. So what did actually UKCA mean? And, and if we had a UKCA mark, would we be able to export? On the other hand, if we had a CE mark, would we be able to be selling in the UK? And when could we get it? Nobody could answer these questions. Nobody in, uh, nobody in uh, Bayes, in, in government, nobody in the notified bodies. There were no answers to these. They, everybody we spoke to in, in any kind of power position uh, their view their view was well if you find out tell us and so this this really put a serious spanner in our works um, so that slowed us down considerably until things started to settle down a little bit in terms of CA marking but that took another three months during which we essentially couldn't do anything we were completely uh, completely blocked so uh, where are we now? Obviously, the production design of this was finalised oh, about a year ago now. And uh, we'd done, we, we, we had done extensive testing with uh, Lewisham Hospital, got very positive feedback, uh, positive feedback from one or two other uh, hospitals who brought prototypes as well. We'd sorted out the filter problem, got the supply chain for manufacture, paid out a lot of money for all the injection mold, and we made 50 production units and got them on the shelf. All of that was completed in uh, March this year while we were still taking a risk on uh, what would happen about CE or CA marking. And finally, the notified body were ready to start uh, testing uh, in April 2021. So we submitted this in April 2021 with a nominal 12 weeks lead time. We're now in mid-October and we're still waiting. So the notified body have had this now for, for six months, uh, as distinct from the 12 weeks that they said it would take. We have fortnightly meetings with them. And quite frankly, I don't know what they do in between those meetings because they said that this was something like 12 days of work to do the testing. But still we wait. And nobody seems to be able to move this forward any faster. So obviously, uh, in terms of being able to market it, anybody that can take this to market for us or indeed to sell it ourselves, we can't do anything until we've got that UKCA marking by law. If we sell equipment that's not UKCA marked and somebody has a problem with it, then there's a big liability problem. But of course, in the last six months now, the situation has changed. Uh, COVID is, it seems, receding, but we all know that things are unpredictable. We haven't seen the emergence of a lot of new variants which were widely predicted and which um, we all thought would probably happen. Uh, but having said that, if a new variant comes out tomorrow which achieves vaccine escape, and one day it will, we could be back to square one and there could be, we could be faced with uh, massive demand again. So in terms of the frustrations that we faced, lack of route to government for innovators, Ideas for better solutions. Rather than locking the country down, there are loads of engineers and, and companies in this country that could have, could have come up with comparable uh, uh, equipment to this or, or alternative equipment or could have adopted the manufacture of this equipment if we'd been able to get through these, uh, the, these barriers at an early stage. But there is no route there. The only route into government was through a... Uh, uh, through a website which uh, says, uh, if you can make face masks, we're interested. If you're not, go away. 
the people I know who registered on that never got any feedback from it anyway. Of course, if you're a household name like James Dyson, he got a lot of publicity from, for, for making um, a ventilators. And by the way, a shed load of money from the government uh, for doing that. If you're a household name, if you're a celebrity, then of course you can get a route into government. If you're just uh, an engineer uh, or a company that's got a uh, potential solution, there's no route. There's also a lack of joined up thinking. And the thing that really strikes me more than anything was the fantastic help we got from Innovate UK. Innovate UK saw the potential in what we were doing and they agreed to, to partly fund uh, the, uh, the, the, the work, the project which uh, I've described, uh, without which we would have struggled with our, just doing it with our, our personal money. Um, and they were very pleased. They were very happy with the outcome. And uh, they've used it as a, as a case study, in fact, uh, for their own publicity. But once the engagement with Innovate had finished, there's no handover. There's no hand on to any other sort of government department. We said to them, look, you know, you've given us taxpayers money to help develop this. Can you now please help us to make the contacts in the NHS, in government and what have you, that could actually use this investment that the taxpayer has made? And the answer was, no, we can't do that because that wouldn't be a level playing field. You have to find your own route in. And words fail me as to what the logic is that if taxpayers' money is invested in something, there's then no way to give that some kind of exposure, even if not priority, just some kind of exposure to be able to exploit it for the, for the good of the taxpayer. So that I find completely perverse. The inflexibility of the regulatory framework to accommodate new ideas. As I say, the fact that we're, we're still testing this to a standard for welding equipment, which is, is, is because that's the only standard there is, and by law it has to meet a standard. Not to mention the costs involved, of course, in doing that. The appallingly slow response of a notified body, um, even in an emergency like this. And as far as Brexit is concerned, the utter utter shambles which uh, has resulted in the whole regulatory framework for so many things and this not only affects this project but as chairman of Sharpa, a, a group that uh, an organization that represents 115 member companies uh, even now there is a complete lack of clarity over the whole aspect of regulatory framework of supply of equipment and the um whether we should be in or out of Europe is, is you know, a moot point. But the, the, the shambolic way in which this has been handled uh, as, uh, is, is just, to me, probably one of the worst acts of self-destruction that this country has ever faced. I, I don't even have the words without being exceedingly rude to express how I feel about what the politicians have done to industry in this country. So if we got a more positive and timely response to adopt innovation like this, and I'm sure there were plenty of other people that must have uh, tried to do similar things and faced the same barriers. If we'd been able to make, give one of these to every person in the UK, that would have cost six billion pounds, something like that. If that would have stopped lockdown with a loss of 450 billion, that seems like a low price to me, not to mention the thousands of lives. Will these lessons be learned? I think we all know what the answer to that is. There'll be a public inquiry, but the terms of, re the terms of reference of the public inquiry will, will, will open by saying that you won't pin this on the government. So where does the future go? Well, obviously, COVID uh, slackening off. There are certainly lots of other healthcare challenges with highly infectious diseases such as Ebola. There's also uh, possibilities in industry as well. People work in dusty atmospheres, pharmaceuticals and so on. But um, of course, if we have to make any changes, this is going to require the whole notified body certification process to happen all over again, which is going to set us back a long way. 
How do we get the investment? To be honest, solving the technical inv and investment challenges are small compared with the regulatory problems that we've faced on this. Will we ever get our money back? I doubt it. Knowing what I know now, would I have set out? Well, there's an interesting question. Yeah, I probably would because I feel as an engineer, it's my duty to try to uh, use skills to safeguard society, even if I fail. So the main takeaway from this experience for me is engineers are very good at solving problems with innovative solutions. But the battle against the, the intransigence, the cost, and the inflexibility of regulation, the lack of interest amongst people in power, the incompetence of government, and, and the self-interest of the few companies that, that, that uh, because of household names, have got their, uh, their, their snaps in the trough, um, is a monumental problem to face by comparison. Truth be told, we've probably lost this battle and our investment, the taxpayers' investment as well. But who knows? The next pandemic, the, the virus escape variant might just come round before our notified body approval expires. Who knows? So that's uh, where I want to finish. And I will say a great thanks to everybody who's helped in this monumental effort. This has involved hundreds of people along the way, as well as the core team. Um, if we do get to save some lives, I'll be happy. If not, well, at least we tried. Thank you, Mike, for a, a very informative presentation. Um, I'm just uh, going to take some questions now. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to put them into the uh, into the Ask a Question box, and we'll we'll try to get through them all if we can. Um, I do have one initially, though. Um, I was, Obviously, within your um, within your presentation, you you faced a, a lot of challenges, which is an understatement, uh, into sort of getting getting your prototype made and getting into production. Um, what are your current thoughts on on trying to start a manufacturing company in the UK, and 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 what would you change? Um, obviously, I know that producing PPE is is one of the most regulated types of products you can get into, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm sort of keen to hear your thoughts on starting a small to medium manufacturing company in, in 2021 in the UK. My advice to anybody doing that would be to look at what you have to do in terms of meeting regulation. Uh, if you're going to be making a product which you can uh, self-certify, uh, which is the case of course with a lot of equipment, then, then I would say go for it. I think there are massive opportunities at the moment. There is a lot of problems of course in getting materials, in getting uh, labour as well at the moment. Um, but I think the, 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 the problems of solving the technical problems, putting together the manufacturing supply chain, putting together uh, um, or solving the, um, the need for investment and so on, I think they are relatively small compared with if you have to face a substantially regulated environment. So just be careful what it is that you're going to make, I'd say. Thank you. Um, I have another question about the that first prototype that you made. Uh, recognizing um, during the, the lockdown, I was 3D printing visors and things, and it was very hard to get in touch with any suppliers or anything. So that that first prototype with the um, with that the clear um, hood on, uh, how how was that produced? Was that sort of plastic welded or stitched or? There's a bit of a funny story behind that, actually. It was uh, it was machine stitched uh, as it happens out of PVC sheet and uh, uh, um, woven fabric. Um, just before the lockdown happened, uh, it, I should say, in my spare time, I'm a competition dancer, ballroom and Latin American. And um, just before the uh, the the lockdown hit, uh, myself and my dance partner, we'd actually. Um, uh, we qualified to dance in the national finals in Blackpool last year in 2020, which of course was cancelled, as indeed was this year's. Um, and uh, the, the dressmaker that we used for costumes uh, was suddenly without any work to do, not only because she makes um, dance costumes, but also she makes a lot of wedding dresses. So uh, she was without any work, and we were desperate for somebody uh, to do some stitching for us. So that just slotted into place nicely as it happened. Fantastic. 
Um, and another question, uh, obviously you've, you've been uh, tangled up in the web of CE and UK CA marking and, and the sort of uh, transition between the two. Uh, are those rules any clearer now? Because um, I, I, I've, I've started to see some UK CA marking logos come come in and labels of, of new products and things, but um, yeah, I'm not I'm not too familiar with with the the rules around that. Yeah, if you're making something in the UK to be sold in the UK, then it's relatively straightforward. But things are starting to settle down now because uh, the um, you know the rules are now a bit clearer. The big difficulty is where you're buying uh, equipment or sub-assemblies from abroad to put into equipment that you're either selling in the UK, well particularly that that you're selling in the UK in fact, because um, if you're uh, incorporating devices or equipment into a system, as a lot of our sharper members do, uh, which you're then installing in the UK, uh, you have to put a UK CA mark on it but what is the validity of um, uh, CE marked equipment when it comes to incorporation into a CA mark, UK CA mark system? And there's a complete and utter lack of clarity on this, uh, whether that will be acceptable or not be acceptable. And the problem that a lot of our sharper members face is that they buy uh, CE marked um, uh, subsystems, shall we say, from overseas and a lot of the suppliers are saying well the UK is only a small market so we are not going to pay out to have UK CA uh, uh, certification done as well as the uh, what we have to pay for um, uh, obtaining and maintaining CE market so this is causing a, a lot of difficulties uh, at the moment and you know some parts are settling down but I still see this is a this is a huge break on industry at the moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I'm not seeing any more questions uh, coming through, so I think um, that will probably just about finish us up. So, um, just in closing remarks, uh, we do have another talk um, in the Impulse to Innovation series. It's about strategic innovation and the impact of external stakeholders. And that's by uh, John Clegg on the 3rd of December. So that's it, I did for the diaries. Uh, other than that, though, thank you very much for the talk, Mike, uh, and everybody else for, for coming along and supporting. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for your attention.